the podcast that floats down here. <laughs> Hello, and welcome back to the podcast that floats down here. I'm Luke. I'm Ben. I'm Melissa. We are here doing Stephen King's It, Part 1, The Shadow Before, Chapter 2, After the Festival, 1984. This chapter was 22 pages, and that is 2.02% of this book. Melissa, tell us about this chapter. It's 1984, and we have a death being investigated. Adrian Mellon was walking with his boyfriend, Don Haggerty, when three teenagers came after him. According to the interviews, Adrian had words with the three boys earlier in the festival because of their homophobia. Annoyed by Adrian, the three, led by John Webby Garten, attacked Adrian, pushing, hitting, abusing him until they pushed him over a bridge, while Don, who had also been attacked, watched helpless. As Adrian went over the bridge, both Don and one of the boys, Chris Unwin, saw a clown under the bridge. Chris reported seeing the clown take a bite out of Adrian's body, and Don heard a voice saying, Float with us, Don, and thousands of balloons floated under the bridge with them. The police, unsure of whether to believe Don or not, advised him not to mention the clown, because it would help the defense keep the boys from prison. No one said anything about a clown at trial where the boys were convicted. But, due to the appeal process, none of the boys went to prison. Going into this book, I didn't know what to expect at all. I definitely did not expect it to include like this harsh beginning of like super gay bashing and... I never would have guessed that that would have been a part of the story. So even with the typical, you know, homophobia and everything that was back in the 1980s, you know, or, you know, early 80s and everything, because that's right when the, the movement started to become prominent again, the violence and the amount of hatred, especially from the three teens, to me, it's like, there's something extra there. You know, it's just, you know, it, that's not typical even of a typical anti-gay person. I disagree. I, I think it's kinda, incredibly I think typical. It's fairly accurate. I I think this was like when Don showed Adrian the bridge and all the writing. There was definitely more. The, the town is more vocal about it than you're going to hear in most towns. Especially, I mean, you have to remember this is 1985. This is right when the AIDS epidemic first started. When it was all oh that gay disease. Oh, like it really did feel like that. I think the piece that adds in for this is that moment when those three start physically attacking him and they get almost that chanting mob mentality piece. You can almost feel Pennywise influencing them in that moment. Yeah, and that's not what leading I was up to th- no, I, I, and that's what I'm yeah. trying to like distinguish. I think in general the homophobia is exactly what it was, which is horrible and a whole other thing. Yes. But I think the part of Derry or the part of Pennywise that is the influence is the actual attack piece. Because I don't think it would have been that bad somewhere else if it weren't for the influence of this monster. I'll go ahead and say I had no inkling that Pennywise was influencing them at all. I got none of that in this chapter because they seemed so surprised later on when he shows up. I don't think it's the physical representation of Pennywise. I think it's like Don says at the very end, right before he breaks down and he's like, what do you think it is? It's dairy. Yeah. Like the whole thing. And I think we're going to get into that for sure. But, and, and, but that's what it is. That's the influence Pennywise has. It's the overall hatred of everything. It's the fact that they knew something was going to happen at the end. Everybody knew it. Yeah. But, Nobody knew what it was. They didn't put it on the schedule, but everybody knew. Yeah. Something was going to happen. I thought, I thought that was a pretty because neat line. Because that's dairy. That is the thing that's not typical. Exactly. The fact that everybody knows things are going to happen. Nobody talks about it. It's, and that kind of goes to one of my points uh, that I made uh, was I found it uh, interesting that the Lady Society vetoed photographs for, yep. for dairy days that uh, shows kind of the darker side that Mike uh, Hanlon wanted to show off. Uh 
it was so, a, a quote of it. It was it was so much better to accentuate the positive and eliminate the negative. It goes to shows that the town's mentality of whitewashing history and being able to forget, being able to ignore, and yeah. that kind of thing. And everybody knows it. Yeah. Everybody knows. I love this introduction to Derry, and for me, it feels like a reintroduction. I forgot how dirty the underside of Derry was, and how everybody knows it. Yeah, and everybody chooses to forget, and they forget hard. Oh, yeah. Now, I do have a question for you really quick. Uh, you may want earmuffs, but, I mean, has it been me- has it been mentioned about... Just really quick, that means Luke is actually covering his ears, because yeah. the question is for me. Yeah. Uh, I can't remember in the chapter, uh, did they mention that the murder rate is significantly higher I don't remember so that far? yet. Yeah. Okay, okay. Okay, so, like, having said I really liked my introduction to Derry, it was really horrible to read this chapter. Oh, yeah. Like, it was horrible, and not... In the same way, the first chapter was horrible to read, and I didn't want to open the book. I'm really having, like, I'm, I'm waiting for it to be like I have to keep turning the page. And it's not for the violence, and it's not for the scary clown. It's it's for just the blatant homophobia and culturally accepted gay bashing. Yeah. It, it's disgusting, and, and it's like a visceral reaction, not because of what King is saying, but because of, and I know it is not nearly as tolerant as i wish it was but the amount of tolerance we have now where marriage is just marriage regardless of who it is you're marrying and and there are benefits to partners and all those things are in place like i'm having a hard time reading this and not hating on king for writing it except it was the 1980s when this is how it was i had to stop and say okay this was not written 2017 2018 2000 even 2012 like this was written in 1985 and this was a time when if you were out of the closet it it, it meant your life was hell so the fact that elmer curdy <laughs> didn't realize he was the owner of a gay bar is a bit funny that is really funny though yeah, i will give you that probably does happen fairly often i mean most bars are like almost entirely dudes like all the time anyway right like especially if you have like a little bit i mean i don't know that part i was okay with like it it doesn't seem that weird to me that like because it it goes on to say like because he admits he's like if i ever said that to somebody in the town of Derry, they'd say i was you know lying or whatever he says and it's Mm -hmm. like i I don't know it seems reasonable and he's not going to turn the people away no matter what they are because he needs the business Right. So, and if he's got solid business with a nice, well mannered group of people who clearly seem to get along a lot better than right. the hetero counterparts, like they like mixed right. drinks, and <laughs> I thought that was a really nice way of putting it. Like, hey, we're you know, it's a yeah. better b- better clientele, yeah. mm-hmm. and it is. <laughs> and like the extreme homophobic assumptions, the people who hadn't been there yeah. also seem. Yeah, like, that's... fairly accurate. Yes. Like, if you haven't been there and you don't realize it's just, a, like, another bar. Like, there's nothing weird. Yeah. yeah, it could pretty easily come into these really outlandish claims of, yeah, there's a guy out back that'll, you know, whatever for you. I feel like that sentiment is accurate. Because that's the belief that people had, which is so wrong. Yeah, but it, I, I agree. agree. Uh, one thing that I kind of enjoyed or I guess appreciated was like uh, the one police officer at, at the carnival was like, now you leave those little gay boys r- uh, alone. You know, he didn't care. I mean, yeah, he didn't like what they were doing. Obviously, he, you know, made the comments, made whatever slurs that he had against them. But he still knew, you know what? They're being respectful. You're not. I will beat your if you do anything, I'm going to let them go, you know, kind of thing. And even though he wanted to, even though he, he, he personally might have hated what they were doing, uh, he went above that and was like, no, I'm not going to let you just have your way with it. And I, you know, kind of just did appreciate that. You know, yeah, it was kind of, very, very well um, you know. officiated. So in our other podcast, we always talk about the characters that are introduced. Can I just point out I'm really freaking glad we're not doing that this time? There are a time. lot of characters. A lowball estimate is there are 45 characters in this chapter. No way. You don't think? It didn't seem like that many. Probably 30. Okay. Lowball. 30 characters. And I'm not even talking like, I mean, it could just be the prosecutor or whatever, but there are 30 distinct, 30 plus distinct people in this chapter who, spoiler alert, we never see again. Yeah. That seems to be a trend. That's my point. Chapters one and two, at least. (laughs) This is my point. So... (laughs) Imagine that. So you met in chapter one, we met Bill's whole family, four people. We met Pennywise, five. We met the guy who got Georgie's body out of the thing, six. 
the only mention we have of any of those six people is Dave Gardner's son. So, like, thank you for when I suggested, hey, let's not keep track of the characters. I really, really meant it. And and that, like, just I, my brain would not be able to do that. Yeah, That's no. so many people to keep track of. For nothing. Right. Because yeah. she's going to die anyway, right, Georgie? Yeah, Aww, King definitely Georgie. is a wor- world builder. He very much is great at introducing people. And he's good at ending people, too. But... <laughs> <laughs> they just don't get to people a lot in the middle. Yeah, exactly. All right. I, I gotta say, I think, it, and this sounds a little weird, uh, but the Neanderthalic mentality of the teenagers, I kind of find it interesting that a 17-year-old would have that much civic pride to be uh, that angry at somebody of a different, you know, uh, group of people for wearing a hat that says, I heart dairy. That's not civic pride. I know. That's it's ownership. Not. I understand. I, and I'm being sarcastic with it but mm. it's, you know because i've never met a 17 year old who would you know uh be like oh i you know oh, i heart st louis or i heart you know it's like they, they don't have that mentality i think it's a little bit different when you have small town mentality in with it true st louis is a very large metropolitan area where we understand just by nature there's a lot of different groups so you kind of just have to be okay with that or else you're going to drive yourself crazy right. entirely. Yeah. I mean, there are people who still have problems with that. But right. in a small town, it's a lot easier for that overall group to take ownership and feel like anything that's outside of this social norm has got to go. Like, it's just it, – it, it cannot yep. have its own pride, uh, for lack of a better term, in being a part of this entity that's an outsider trying to take ownership – over what we consider ours. No, and so I, he's standing up for what he thinks is protecting the integrity of what his the white male is privilege saying. is showing. I'm, I'm serious. It's this is my town. I belong here. You're a insert racial slur and you don't this can't be yours. You don't get this. Yes. Oh, no, I, I understand. I know I was just saying it was I found it funny that he used the term of civic pride when it's like, no, oh, yeah, no, no 17 year old, you know, neat, you know, knucklehead. Is no. gonna gonna be that in depth of I, it's my town and that kind of thing. No, no, no. But that was his excuse. Yeah. No, I know. I agree that's with what, you. Like that was his excuse. That's his justification. For it. Yeah. His like personal... oh, because I'm proud of this and I don't want people like you because my town's too good for this. Exactly. Even though really it's just his own bigoted yes. privilege. Yes, absolutely. No, absolutely. Yeah. So Unwin and Dubay pretty quickly just follow along with the highly aggressive, like they they like the bullying, like they seem like they're kind of going against it for a, like a while and they're like hey just leave it alone you know like let's just go especially when the officer's there and like telling him to right to get out of here and and webby just isn't hearing him and is just full force straightforward on we're gonna make this this gay guy pay right for doing this completely harmless thing like they they do a good job i think of trying to be convincing to be like hey let's just leave it alone let's let's just leave or go do something else and then once it turns to, like, the violent part, yeah, they quickly jump on. And it's so, like, I'm coming back to, like, I can see that maybe there was some other influence now looking at it in that lens. But ahead, without it, I was just like, I guess they're just kind of sticking up for their buddy since he already started it. Like, they didn't want him to be alone on it kind of thing, which I think happens. Like, if, if your buddy starts a fight, you're like, well, I can't just sit back and let this fight happen, yeah. which is dumb. I'm not condoning that at all, but... It does happen. My thought is more, this wasn't a fight, this was an attack. Right. Which is a little different. It is a little different. That's my only... And I I will say, too, on, I believe it was Unwin's credit, he was one that was the most held back, and even with uh, Adrian's boyfriend... uh, Don. Don. You know, he he knocked him back, but he was like, run. Get out of here. Go. Get get out out of here. You don't want any part of this. Exactly. But he... He he knew that they were going to attack him and hurt uh, Adrian, but he didn't. You know, I honestly feel he didn't think about throwing him over the you know railing into the. I don't think any of them did. Oh, I think uh, Webby. I think I thought Webby. I did. think Webby had the he, he had I the full don't. mentality too. I you don't think... tell me. No one tells me to suck the root. I know he was already. Set. But I don't he think he planned on throwing him over. That bum rush part was when things yes. really seemed to flip, and yeah. that was my point. That's kind of my thinking. Which I didn't quite understand I, what was going on. I've read a lot of King. And that is a very typical King mob mentality where you see them become unhinged. That was not Webby having a plan. That was them 
sort of losing control of their senses, which I think was influenced by the arrival of the clown. Yeah. I really believe that up until that point, it was when just that the started, regular bigoted it was we're just going to kick his ass, yeah. not we're going to kill and him. Get rid of so, the hat. But from... in fairness, Webby, in front of the cops, said, I'm going to hurt you bad. I, think I might kill you. Guy, tough I know. Guy I think that's tough guy talk. I really do. Yeah. Because, again, typical 17 year old, they talk like that. And I, you I, over exaggerating what I'm going to do to, yes. to get your dominance onto that person be like i'm better than you and i will kill you next time i say you're not he's not you're not you're not even gonna talk to me right like i i really think that there is like a pheromone in the air when pennywise maybe his essence is around because he feeds on that he does he feeds on the anchor he feeds yeah and so and you know what's cool is when he feel and he can make it more and he can make it more or does does he bring it or does he is he attracted to it i think he's attracted to it and then he grows it sure it's like mold do you know what i mean like it's attracted to this and then because it has this other thing it grows more which means this comes like i just yeah i don't know I, i i think reading back through it again i i'd be curious to see like where that point where he clearly seems to come in. Like, it says they were laughing while they were attacking him and things, and I feel like they they were already in that state at that point, which was yeah. right before the bums rush. But that was the part that really stood out to me when I first read through it as, yeah, they're unhinged. Like, something right. something snapped and changed all three of their... Yes. ...reaction, or their, 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 their actions. Yes. So, the, the quote says... Wait until I finish my novel, okay? Please? October. I promise no later. The air's better here. He didn't know it was the water he was going to have to watch out for, Don Haggerty said bitterly. It's it's one of those like false foreshadowing type things where it's like he's clearly enjoying this one thing, but it's kinda like chapter one, something else that kills him. It's kind of it's it's a similar he liked the air. Right, but he liked the, the air, but it's the water that, yeah. that Georgie takes was him afraid out. Of the... He was afraid of the monster in the basement, but it was the monster out in the out and about. So I, I just felt like that was kind of a similar yep. type theme. Yeah, and one thing I will say, you know, I did like how uh, King made Adrian basically fall in love with Derry when everybody else from the town is it's crap. Yeah, you know this you know cute little gay guy from new york decides to come up to maine because the air is clear and i can actually write and everything right and even with all the hatred around he's like no i love it here and he wore the you know the hat unironically he wasn't you know trying to make fun of the town or anything he just he loved it here you know yeah and that's you know now i guess that's the kind of thing if don haggerty was the one that got thrown over you know he kind of had that uh uh pessimistic or uh right what's the term i'm looking for uh um, more realistic view like well <laughs> cynical uh, cynical thank you that's that yeah. was the word cynical view of the town and just adrian with his kind of pie in the sky everything's great it's like that it's it's, all... it makes you feel a little bit worse that you know he it was, was the guy who liked the place exactly yep all that's right. a lot like chapter one again yeah. right yeah you know, georgie the, the was yeah the innocent one which think about that it's been 27 years since georgie was killed and it's starting again All right, so let's do questions for the new reader. All right, so Luke, how do you feel about the police in Derry handling the case of Aiden's death? It's actually Aiden, not Adrian. Oh. Huh. <laughs> but Aiden. Sorry, Aiden. Sorry, Aiden. Sorry, Aiden. Well, again, I'm going to have trouble remembering all their names, but the one officer who clearly takes the clown part seriously or not seriously but he has a hard time dismissing it because he heard it from two completely unrelated sources gardner yeah gardner yeah so and that's dave gardner's son okay so like he seems like he was you know at least willing to hear out this weird situation not necessarily that he believed it but he thought it was worth bringing up Everyone else wants to sweep it underneath the rug and pull the whole dairy ignorance oblivion card, and you know let's let's put these guys away because they probably deserve it in general, not necessarily for this crime, which is 
crappy. Maybe not for the death of the guy, but, but at least the attack the, the on the guy. The sentiment and yeah. what happened. Let's just, them let's just happened. pin it on them regardless of what... It's, it's frustrating to see, but I'm starting to gauge how dairy works a little bit, and that doesn't surprise me in the least. Right. So I think this kind of goes along with the question that you had for me. All three sentences are under appeal. Is that because they are getting the hetero benefit or because more events in this story will influence their sentences? I, I think, yeah, they're under appeal uh, right which now. Which means they're not in prison. I yeah. mean, they did like a short which, which stint is weird. Like, which, which is a weird thing because typically even if they're convicted and they're on appeal, they get sent to prison. So this is like a weird – I don't know if King just wrote this just to kind of piss people off. Or make you think there is something wrong with the town or, you know, like that kind of thing. Because it's like on the legal standpoint, that would that never happen. Because it says they were sentenced know. to like 15 years. Yeah. I don't know. Webby. I, well, I don't know. you. Uh, Web, Webby and Gar- or, uh, Dubai. Webby and uh, Dubay were both sentenced to, uh, to prison uh, for second degree manslaughter. And Unwin, uh, Unwin was, was uh, underage. Yeah, he was a minor, so he was only sent to like eighteen months or something like that. So they were uh, sentenced, but it's on appeal, so they never went. But that's the thing. In legal standards, it doesn't matter if it's on. They should still be in prison regardless. And so I think that might be just King's right, I'm, way. I'm, of, just, I'm just trying to but clarify. No, they that, didn't. Yes, go. they did yeah, not. But they did go. not go because you okay. read that correctly. Uh, but yeah, the, I think that just might be King's way of sure. You know, getting the reader. I definitely oh, yeah. did a double take the, when reading. It was like, wait, yeah. just said they were in prison for 20 yep. years or whatever. And I was like, oh wait, no, clearly not. So I'll just make sure I understood that correctly. Yeah, no, definitely. And yep. It's a confusing thing that I think he just took a little liberty with the law. And I know you sort of asked why. Like, is it because of that hetero, like, you know, white male privilege thing? Or right. is it – and I think it probably is more that than if anything else comes up in the story. But I don't remember if they're later in the story. It also – it feels like it might be the – to me, like, the dairy influence still. It's like, let's – Let's not Brush it go the this Brush so that we can keep rug. brushing it so it doesn't put a bad name or bring it I up can see that. for the city, yeah, for the yep. town itself. All right. Now let's talk about my favorite thing this chapter. Melissa, what was your favorite thing this chapter? My favorite thing, and here's the thing, I think we use the word favorite not to mean like something I really enjoyed, but to most interesting or... The thing that stood out to me. Yeah. He thought again and again that it was as if Derry Canal Days ended with one final event, which everyone had somehow known about, but which no one had quite dared to put down on the daily program of events. If they had, it would have looked like this. Saturday, 9 p.m., Final band concert featuring the Dairy High Band and the Barbershop Mellow Men. Saturday, 10 p.m. Giant fireworks show. Saturday, 10.35 p.m. Ritual sacrifice of Adrian Mellon officially ends Canal Days. I thought that was a really interesting line as well. Like, that one definitely stuck out yeah. to me. Like, yeah. the ritual sacrifice of <laughs> a flamboyantly and, gay guy. And everyone knows it's yep. yeah. going to happen. Yeah. It's disturbing. Yeah, I agree. So my f- favorite thing this chapter was a, a quote as well, and it said, I don't believe he called you anything, Machen replied, and you spoke to him first, I believe. Now move on, Sonny. I don't want to have to tell you again. He called me a queer. Are you worried you might be then? Machen asked, seeming honestly interested, and Garden flushed a deep, ugly red. I like that he just like calls him out, and he's like, you know what? Whoa. Are you afraid? I think it says, are you afraid you might be? Not yeah. like, well, are you? It's like, yeah. are you afraid you might be? I think it's just a funny way of like turning it back on Webby. Yeah. To right. be like, I love well, it. What's, I the, that was... what's the problem? Right. Like, like, is that something you were having personal struggles with? I just, I like no, the I'm... way it was written. So my favorite thing was, uh, I started after him and the clown looked back. I saw his eyes and all at once I understand who, I understood who it was. Who was it, Don? Harold Gardner asked softly. It was Derry, Don Haggard said. It was this town. Well, and what'd you do then? I ran, you dumb shit. <laughs> yeah. I just, you know, it's like, that's pretty, it is. Derry is the damn clown, or the clown is Derry. It's, you know. Or Derry, with, even without, like, there's something wrong. 
There's something peculiar. Something's <laughs> rotten in the state of Denmark. <laughs> Pull out some Hamlet on their ass. Oh, Hamlet, 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 Hamlet. I Hamlet. hate Hamlet. Uh, and I hate the play, ever. I hate Hamlet. And I hate the play Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead based on Hamlet. All right, well, I think that's all we have this chapter. You can find us on Twitter at Floats Down Here. Send us an email at floatsdownhere at gmail.com. Come and visit us and check out other podcasts at thepodcastthat.com. Subscribe and rate us on iTunes or YouTube. Join us next time for Chapter 3. Six Phone Calls, 1985. You'll float, too. Stay imaginary. Thanks. Now is the time of the show that we would like to award our giveaway contest winner their prize. An official It novel with artwork from the movie. The winner is, drumroll please, Maggie Kitterman from Fresno, California. Congratulations. We hope you listen through episode two and episode three and all of the other episodes to come. And also, tell a friend. We are big fans of you, Maggie Kitterman. Everything down here floats.